so I want to live forever. And there's a problem with that because everyone that's ever lived has died. What's, something's got to give, right? I mean, what do I do? So uh, if, I ha- if I have to accept my own mortality, uh, then what can I do to improve my health for as long as I can to give me a good enough shot to live as long as I can? So today I'm going to uh, talk to you guys today about using an evidence-based, personalized approach to health. So I'm not the first one to have this idea of living forever. This is uh, Jack Lane, referred to as the godfather of fitness. So what you can see on the left is Jack in his 40s, Jack at 70 on the right, and then Jack at 95, and sadly, de- dead at 96. So as another example, uh, there's Bob Del Montague, and, and I mean, Bob's just amazing. I mean, 17, 67, 80, he looks more fit at 80 than he was at 17. <laughs> but sadly, he died in 93. So from this, it's, it should be pretty clear that exterior fitness, fit on the outside, doesn't necessarily equal interior fitness. So how can we optimize both exterior and interior fitness? So exterior fitness is pretty easy. It's calorie controlled to stay lean and, and exercise. And you know that you can be fit like Jack, Jack Lane and Bob Del Montague. But what about uh, interior fitness? How can we optimize that? So generally, um, data from large epidemiological studies is used to guide public health decisions about health. Right, so like I said, data from large epi studies guide public health, health recommendations, you know, eat less salt and sugar, what have you. But the problem with that is it's population-based, doesn't work for everyone. You know, we all have different DNA or slightly different DNA. So what works for somebody may not work for me. So how can this approach be made more specific? So with that in mind, earlier this year, President Obama announced uh, increased funding, 215 million, for this precision medicine genetic plan. So what what does that mean? So if you look at outcomes like heart disease, cancer, cognition, physical function, whatever, and you also measure DNA in all those subjects in a huge volume of subjects, 10,000, 100,000 people, and you start to look for associations, you can start to say with some uh, measure of certainty, certain genes being associated with certain health-related outcomes. And if you know that, then you can start to design interventions to reduce your risk of disease and potentially increase your, improve your health and increase your lifespan. Well, that sounds good to me. I'm all for that. So um, when will that be here? So what you're looking at here is the cost per genome. And uh, the, the human genome was first sequenced in 2001. And you can see the cost is $100 million dollars outrageous for one genome. So over the last 13 years, that price has dramatically fallen to where it is now at about five to $7,000 per genome. Now, if you're going to do a study of 10,000 people, 10,000 times 5,000 is a $50 million study. This is, I mean, it's way too much. So the, that price has got to come down dramatically, probably uh, to $100 or less. So how long is it going to take for, if it took 13 years to drop from 100 million to 5,000, how long is it going to take to drop to $100 per genome? So um, I've got that estimated somewhere in the 2020. So that's five to 10 years away. Um, so it's a nice idea, but what can we do until then? I mean, I, I'm trying to live forever. I'm not trying to wait 10, 20, 30 years to optimize my health. So what can we do? The strategy is to use data from large epidemiological studies to guide decisions related to health. Um, and once we've got the epi data, track your own biochemistry. You know, what does that mean? Um, so when you go, it's as simple as when you go to the doctor for that $30 copay, you get a readout of like 45 different measurements and actually measure those things over time. And I'm going to show you my approach for how I do that. Let's uh, use, an, use an example. How much protein should you eat? Just as simple as that. Lots of meat, less meat. You know, what's good for you? So in this study of 3,000 subjects, we can see that uh, going from low protein to a high, medium protein to a high protein diet, in terms of death from all causes, all cause mortality risk, Eating too much protein is bad for you. Now, in another study, and this one, again, big epi study, 8,000 subjects, we see the opposite. So we've got no effect on uh, mortality risk for a high-protein diet, but actually the opposite here. Eat less protein, increase mortality risk. So uh, if I've confused you, that's good. I'm trying to do that. <laughs> you see it all the time in the media. They'll say one thing, and then two weeks later, you've got contradictory data from another study. So to, f- to go further into this, you need to investigate uh, uh, what, hap- what actually happens when you eat more protein than your body needs. So how would we know if your protein intake is too high or too low? 
So when, you, when, when we eat protein, protein is comprised of uh, amino acids, and our body will digest those amino acids as shown. If you have too much uh, uh, of amino acids in your body, your body will degrade that amino group by uh, sending it to the liver or actually in the liver. It'll enter the urea cycle, and then your liver will produce this metabolite called urea. So measuring blood urea nitrogen can tell you something about your protein intake. And uh, that's verified by uh, this data here, which basically just shows urea production and protein intake, nitrogen intake. So it's almost a perfect linear association. The more protein you eat, the more urea you're going to produce. So, so measuring your, your blood amount of urea should tell you how much protein you're eating. So why is this blood urea nitrogen important? And it's all about mortality risk for me. I'm trying to reduce my risk of disease and, and live as long as I can. So let's see what it says. So the reference range is 6 to 20, and that's indicated by the black dashed lines. So even though the reference range is at 20, you can see that a, a value of 15 versus a value of 20, you've got a higher risk even within the reference range. So what's my blood urea nitrogen? Now, I, me I, I mentioned I've been tracking my own fitness for a very long time. These are my blood urea nitrogen values since uh, 2002, every year up until uh, 2013. So before I educated myself on this subject, and that's the, the 15, the magic 15, stay lower than 15. So you can see for a few years it was actually higher, and at that, that point I was eating you know, whey protein powder, all the stuff you hear about, you know, uh, lots of uh, animal products, fish, meat, whatever. It's too high. It's no good. It's going to increase my risk of death. I don't like that. So, so since then, I've educated myself, and you can see my blood urea nitrogen values are safe, you know, four to six. Um, so based on this, I've got, you know, decreased mortality risk just based on this one biomarker of health. So you, just to show you guys another example, um, here's uh, my blood glucose over the same time span. So... Uh, my average value for that time is 88. What does that mean? Well, the reference range is 60 to 150. That's a huge range. That still doesn't help. So um, here's the mortality data. Big epi study, 40,000 subjects. And what's interesting is that here's your reference range. At the low end of the re reference range, you see high mortality risk. And at the high end of the reference range, again, high mortality risk. So if you just go by reference range, you're going to be shortchanging yourself in terms of what's optimal. So based on the epi data, we can see that I'm there, which puts me at the lowest risk for mortality based on my blood glucose. So using these two measurements, so far so good, whatever I'm doing in terms of diet and, and, and exercise, that should put me at low risk. Now, these are just two examples, and I'm not going to go through all this, don't worry. Uh, but uh, since you know, 2003, I've, I've just taken a snapshot of all these measurements, and as I mentioned, it's a simple blood test. You get it from your doctor, $30 copay. But what I wanted to wanna, wanna, wanna point out is that I've highlighted my HDL and my triglycerides, which were, uh, for HDL, they're in, you know, 50s or so, and my triglycerides, same thing, about 50. So you want to have high HDL, which is a good cholesterol, and low triglycerides. So in 2012, I went uh, vegan. In 2013, I went fruitarian. So ve vegan, for people who don't know, is no animal products, no dairy, no fish, none of that. Uh, fruitarian was almost exclusively fruit, nothing else. And uh, sticking to the literal, I just wanted to see how it would change my stuff. Would it, you know, give me uh, lowest risk and improve my biomarkers of health? So it actually, those two diets actually made my good cholesterol bat worse and made my triglycerides double. So since then, I've modified my diet to make these things uh, go in the right direction. And then in a few months, I'll, I'll uh, update my values. So going back to Jack, uh, his, his mantra was eat real food and exercise. And you know, from 1950 forward, that was a great way to live and get you to 96. But hopefully what I've shown you today is that if maybe if Jack had tracked his biochemistry, he may have lived longer. And that's my hope. So let's see if I'm right. <laughs> yeah.